I'm an economic development. I'm an economic development specialist at the University of Wisconsin, and um, I mostly work on and think about entrepreneurship. So how do we make entrepreneurial places? And so these last few weeks have been focused on why we would use an entrepreneurial strategy in economic development. And last week, we just sort of took a look at the statistics and what are the trends? Where are we in Wisconsin? And then this week is what I call the so what, kind of what do we do about it if we want to pursue entrepreneurship? So I'll be talking about entrepreneurial ecosystems. Um, I had a similar presentation with Dr. Sarah Lowe from the University of Missouri last week, and that was through the Regional Economic Development Initiative at um, or in Indiana. So if you wanted to see a different version or get some more information, that's another place to look. But otherwise, I will get started. All right. I will keep an eye on the chat or do my best to keep an eye on the chat, but I definitely don't mind being interrupted, so don't hesitate to speak up if there's something you want to dive into a bit more. So this is session three of Entrepreneurship 101, and this is going to be about entrepreneurial ecosystem building. So first, we'll talk about why entrepreneurial ecosystem building. Why would we use this approach? So I think already we have, or I've made the case for why we would focus on entrepreneurship to begin with um, in terms of those economic benefits that we discussed, the job creation, innovation, economic growth in terms of GDP or income, sense of place, all of these different types of um, benefits that come from entrepreneurship. And I think entrepreneurial ecosystem building feeds into that because it can increase the quantity and quality of entrepreneurial activity. So that means sending both more entrepreneurs to our SBDC partners, for example, um, so that they're working with more people um, or sending even higher quality ventures to an SBDC. That's just one example of a partner. Um, we do a little bit of working with entrepreneurs ourselves in extension. There are any number of organizations around the state that are in place to help entrepreneurs. But if we can increase the number of people interested as well as um, the number of people using those services and they're more prepared when they arrive, we can get closer to those economic benefits that I discussed. This also encourages dynamism or competition. I think I mentioned this before, but um, we focus on kind of the, the startup component of the economy. But what we know and don't often talk about is that the places that have a really vibrant startup culture also have a lot of failure. So they are very dynamic economies. There's lots of entry and lots of exit. There's lots of experimentation. Um, business is trying new things. Some of those things don't work. They fail. They maybe try the next thing. Um, there are new jobs opening all the time and part of that process. Uh, so dynamism is really the maybe key characteristic we might think of when it comes to these vibrant, thriving economies. Entrepreneurial ecosystem can also to create a buzz around entrepreneurship. So this sort of feeds into the cultural component of building um, momentum around entrepreneurship, attracts more uh, entrepreneurs and investment. So capital being a key component, uh, creates spillovers and in turn more creative destruction. So again, um, spillovers being that what is good for one person or one business can have positive benefits for the community at large um, and creative destruction. So putting that pressure on other businesses so that we're kind of always feeling the edges of the market and what could work. And all of this leads to economic and cultural benefits. Two other um, aspects that I think are important um, is that entrepreneurial ecosystem building is about equitably enhancing entrepreneurship in my mind. So this is, or can be an inclusive approach. So entrepreneurship ecosystem building isn't just about promoting or supporting one type of entrepreneur. Oftentimes the stereotype is that we're very focused on tech or we're very focused on STEM, but an entrepreneurial ecosystem would encompass all of these different types of entrepreneurs and all the different types of demographics, people that they represent, and can be especially beneficial 
to historically underserved audiences. And entrepreneurship can be a particularly important mode for economic mobility and wealth creation. So I think there's um, merit in thinking about entrepreneurship as an inclusive approach to economic development. Um, and it's also more consistent with a portfolio approach. And what I mean by that is sort of a risk management um, lens on economic development. So rather than picking a winner industry, whether that would be manufacturing or tech or you know some sort of maybe instrumentation or any number, computing, any number of industries that might rise to the top as a favorite or the most likely to succeed, if that industry does well, that's great. But if it doesn't, you've invested a lot of resources in something that didn't pan out. And so with an entrepreneurial ecosystem approach, we don't have to choose. We can develop talent across the board. We can support businesses of all different types. If one does particularly well, that might offset the losses of one that doesn't do as well. And so we have a more balanced approach to economic development that's not quite so volatile. We don't see as many ups and downs. I think the last reason that we want to focus on entrepreneurial uh, ecosystem building is because of networks. So entrepreneurial networks are weak in parts of rural America. This is one of the things that makes rural America different from more entrepreneurial places. And that these weak networks can have real intangible consequences for entrepreneurial successes. The, the stronger and more vibrant networks characterize these more entrepreneurial, more dynamic regions. So thinking about what we can do to move in that direction can move us towards a goal of a more entrepreneurial place. We also want to go a step further than thinking about entrepreneur to entrepreneur networks. Those are vital. Entrepreneurs learn a lot from each other. There's a lot of shared information that is time specific and um, kind of industry savvy that goes between entrepreneurs. The shared experience is really important. We often see high degrees of reciprocity between entrepreneurs in terms of helping each other and sharing that valuable information. But what we know is that entrepreneurial networks must contain more than just supportive fellow entrepreneurs. We need to include key community members. So um, elected officials, educators, business service providers, all of these people that entrepreneurs are going to be interacting with and creating the culture around entrepreneurship are also very important to the network. So we want to think in holistically and inclusively about who's in the network in our communities. Um, I had just a couple of questions here. I don't know that we'll have much time, but um, if anybody has an example of would-be entrepreneurs who have been discouraged from starting a business um, or the opposite, maybe there's a great story of supportive encouragement to share that would also be welcome. Um, thinking about how is your community supportive of entrepreneurs risk-taking, doing things differently? What does the current environment look like? Um, you're welcome to put some comments in the chat, or if anybody's willing to speak up, I would welcome some comments. Um, I, my name is Tanaja Hudson. I I can actually say I I took a well. I'm getting ready to open up a home childcare, and I took a CPR class. And the woman who gave me the class, she owned multiple childcares, um, and she she said something to me that stuck out. She told me that if you're looking forward to opening up a child care, um, she'll help. Um, and she doesn't, she doesn't charge a fee. She also told me to just move forward and just go ahead and do it. And like her whole way of doing business. Um, I did pay for that CPR class, but the whole way she did business was very welcoming to the new entrepreneurs coming up that's what I got from her so I just wanted to kind of like point that out yeah that's great thank you so much for sharing that you're welcome um yeah so having that sort of mentorship and somebody willing to role model between entrepreneurs in the community that's another feature that we know defines these strong entrepreneurial regions so I think that was a great example of um one thing we can work towards or try to embrace in entrepreneurial communities so um thanks for that example Tessa this is uh Jessica in um Wapaka County and uh, one of the things I was thinking of when I when I saw these questions is um, but the first question, can you think of would-be entrepreneurs who have been discouraged from starting a business? I think sometimes that discouragement doesn't necessarily come from someone else. Um, I think sometimes it just feels so heavy and hard and 
they don't know what to do. Okay. Um, and so how I would answer these questions is yes, definitely to the first question. The second question, um, I would say, yeah, I wouldn't say that our community isn't supportive, but we definitely don't have a, a strong infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, two things jumped out at me from what you shared, and one is the sort of self-doubt or sort of self-discouragement sometimes, so, and we see this manifest in a number of different ways um, for entrepreneurs, so um, one way in particular that that manifests is with loan applications that entrepreneurs will often, for example, not apply for a loan because they anticipate that they won't get one. So there isn't even the chance for a bank to you know, turn them down because they're sort of self-selecting um, out of that process. So that can look a lot of different ways even before you get to that process, there might be any number of um, obstacles to overcome in terms of self-doubt, but then also the infrastructure in your community. So that we're gonna go on to talk about that. So um, that was a great um, segue for me. So thank you, Jessica. So what is an entrepreneurial ecosystem? So what are the components? What does this even look like? Um, we use the term ecosystem to emphasize the importance of networks and systems. We might think of this in sort of an ecological framework. Here, we're using it in terms of sort of a community framework and what are all of the components that come together to create this system that supports entrepreneurship or this infrastructure that supports entrepreneurship. Um, here I have an OECD definitions, but there are many, many others out there. So an entrepreneurial ecosystem is a set of interconnected entrepreneurial actors, organizations, institutions, and processes. Um, so actors could be a current and aspiring entrepreneurs, organizations, business banks, and venture capitalists. And I, institutions and the sort of Entities I'm listing here, business banks and VCs, universities and governments, I'm listing organizations, but one thing I'll try to say here and reiterate is that we're listing institutions, but this is really about people, right? It is people within the university, people within government, people within the businesses that are forming the interactions across community that are supportive of or maybe not so supportive of entrepreneurship. So keeping in mind that sort of interpersonal component of the network and um, the relational component of the network as well. And then processes, entrepreneurial ambition and acceptance. So how do we think about experimentation? How do we support experimentation, risk-taking, and failure? Um, and some, one thing I just wanted to make sure we take away from this slide is that this is really about a systems approach to entrepreneurship um, that we wouldn't just think of sort of adjusting one component and accept or expect big outcomes that we would want to think about how all of these components work together to drive overall um, the direction of the community towards entrepreneurship. So here I have a couple of examples. So again, like there are many different definitions, there are also many different visualizations and examples. These are just a couple of my favorites. So I like what the Center for Rural Entrepreneurship offers. I think it's nice and simple. You see, we have the business owner in the middle, and then we're thinking about these sort of different buckets or components of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So capital or financing is part of almost any diagram I look at. Um, Undercapitalization is the number one reason entrepreneurs fail. So thinking about the financial re resources in your community, the availability of financial resources is certainly a component of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, capability, I also see this in the form of human capital and that's what it looks like uh, in the diagram to the right where we're looking at an example from Babson. So human capital or skill development, how does an entrepreneur go about getting the skills they need to be successful and even beyond their own skill set, where do they go to hire employees that have the necessary skills as well? What kind of systems are in place to educate and train and develop um, our entrepreneurs and their workers? Um, connection, this can also be called community I've seen, um, but this is about resources and relationships that entrepreneurs at the very least will often need, you know, a confidant, um, they will need moral support, they will need um, somebody to talk to and to identify with, and I think that's one reason oftentimes entrepreneur to entrepreneur networks are so important, is there's just such a mutual understanding that is really important to find when you're facing challenges. Um, culture, that's another really important aspect. 
So, you know, do we celebrate somebody going out on their own? Do we find it exciting to pursue entrepreneurship? Do we even consider it a viable career path? Uh, and that's where maybe, for example, it's even local high schools are really a part of the entrepreneurial ecosystem because they're talking to young adults about what is a reasonable career path and helping them decide and is entrepreneurship on the table. Also, this is um, the regulatory climate or policy environment, also a really important component um, across you know, a number of examples that I've looked at. And I think of this too as tiered. So there's the sort of local policy environment, the state and even federal environment. So thinking about what are the rules of the game? Over the last few weeks, I've heard more than one example about how for um, food entrepreneurs, their local department of public health is just such a key um, friend or foe in some instances of their venture. And so that's an example of how sort of rules and regulations or the policy environment uh, can really support or be a challenge or create a challenge for entrepreneurs. So lots of factors to think about um, you see the really detailed examples to others that are more simple. Um, but again, thinking holistically about all the different players that factor into the entrepreneurial process. And you see that the entrepreneurial ecosystem, I guess my takeaway from these slides is that the entrepreneurial ecosystem is about so much more than just entrepreneurs. Really, we could probably find a place for almost everybody in the community and that they will be in customer perhaps, or they will be part of forming culture. So whenever we walk into a community and we're thinking about the entrepreneurial ecosystem, I like to think of everybody as part of it. Um, so here's another example that we like. Um, capital, you see again, the regu regulatory or policy environment. Um, here, you know, it's called building blocks rather than components. We have the talent or human capital or capability. So using different words, but a lot of overlap. Market access, I didn't talk about before, but it's something that's especially important for rural entrepreneurs when the local market might be small. How do we reach larger markets, perhaps online or through commuting or transporting goods and services? So we need to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem that includes leaders, culture, uh, a culture supportive of risk-taking, innovation, and entrepreneurship. So again, this is how almost anybody at the least is a part of building the entrepreneurial cult culture. So we're all participating in the entrepreneurial ecosystem, um, at least through the cultural component. Technical assistance um, and business service providers. So lenders, lawyers, accountants, real estate agents, bankers, loan officers, these are all working professionals that are likely to interact with business owners in throughout their day. And what kind of supports or signals or help are our business service providers able to offer? And I think this is another challenge in rural areas, just because often those are much thinner markets. So we might not have all business services immediately available. So even ge geographically, thinking about our regional approach to building the entrepreneurial ecosystem. So we may not have you know, a particular component here locally, but maybe a neighboring community does in terms of a financial resource or a business service provider. So can we together create, think of building out our ecosystem in a way that's um, holistic and inclusive and has all of these components? Specialized infrastructure. I'll talk about broadband as a key component of an entrepreneurial ecosystem, the workforce, and um, market access. <clears throat> so here we have um, just an example. This is from Kansas City, Missouri. Um, I just wanted to give a visual, visual representation of kind of one way of going about thinking about the entrepreneurial ecosystem and the relationships and connections. Um, these are color coded in different categories or buckets components of the ecosystem. Again, here I want to reiterate that this group mapped organizations in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. And I think that that's great. Organizations, we are, you know, that's sort of the entities we often turn to in terms of who's supporting entrepreneurs and where we might go for support services and the particular um, leadership that is involved in a community. But what I, again, want us to keep in mind is 
you know, de-emphasizing the organizations and emphasizing the relationships that ultimately it is a person or people that an entrepreneur knows at these organizations that's going to make them more likely to pick up the, up the phone and call. It's referrals from, you know, Susie at one organization to another individual at a different organization. So it's the relationships and people between across organizations, between and across organizations that really um, define the network and give it strength and help resources and opportunities move between people. So, you know, I know so-and-so has an empty office space or um, I know so-and-so is looking for a job. And so all of that sort of information creates uh, movement of resources and opportunities for entrepreneurs that's really important for the network. So I think of this as sort of channels through which resources flow. That's what I see when I look at an entrepreneurial ecosystem map like this one. So how to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem? And the answer is, of course, that it varies. Um, thinking about the uniqueness of place and how every community has different assets that's going to play into what their entrepreneurial ecosystem looks like. There is often a lot of interest and a lot of buzz of let's be um, the next Silicon Valley or you know, pick your favorite city or example and, and let's be the next that. And from even like a theoretical and mathematical perspective down to anecdote, what we know is that that's actually very hard to do. Um, that even if we had here in one of our communities, all of the same inputs that exist in Silicon Valley, all the same industries, all the same education, all the same businesses, that we would probably not evolve to look exactly like Silicon Valley. And that's because relationships evolve uniquely. And so it's important to keep in mind, what are your specific assets? How might the particular features of your community contribute to an overall ecosystem that's going to support what you have locally in terms of talent and entrepreneurial potential? So, getting into how to build an entrepreneurial ecosystem. So creating an entrepreneurial ecosystem requires a community to think about the environment in which firms operate and not about a specific business. So rather than think about how do we help, you know, employer X or how do we recruit firm Y, this is about how do we make our region more friendly to entrepreneurs of all types. So again, a very inclusive approach that's thinking about the whole business community rather than just a particular business type of business or business owner. There is no recipe for entrepreneurial ecosystem development. Each reason has, as I mentioned, a unique set of people and institutions and existing networks or existing relationships a unique culture and history that we want to take into account, unique assets, markets, and policies. Um, so, you know, here we have a question and I, I'm sensitive to time, but again, welcome to um, have somebody interject if they want to answer this question, what assets make your community or region unique? I'm also open to answers in the chat if anybody would like to talk about, you know, is there something that they see in their community that's really unique that fits into how we think about the entrepreneurial ecosystem. I'll go ahead and jump in if you don't mind. I'm Michelle yeah. V. Hill from the University of Wyoming Extension, and my community is Northeast Wyoming. And so our region is heavily um, vested in energy. And with energy, there's all different types, but our our prime one of our primary industries is coal. And we know that coal across the nation the coal um, power plants, all these different things, it is not popular anymore. And so therefore we have to reinvent ourselves in ways that are very, very from the edge, from, from educating people about, you know, you're not gonna have a job. I, they already know, they, some people can see the writing on the wall, other people cannot. And so, um, and we have more antelope than people too. So herein lies the issue as well. And if you're a good communicator, a good networker, then you're able, um, but the leadership, the people have to have a vision for this thing to change 
on a dime because we've been doing this for centuries. And so we don't under, you know, we are in a mindset that is not necessarily helpful to strategize out of this and bring in other markets so that we can and, and help support the entrepreneurs. So anyway, we're in just a, an interesting time place, but we have a great area if you can yeah. stand the cold and all the antelope, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. I think that's great. And I think your story is similar to so many communities that they have a particular industry that has um, been central to their economic story for so long. And if that goes away or is going away, how do you reinvent yourself, as you said, or how does a community reinvent itself? And I think entrepreneurs are central to that story, um, that there might be any number of people with ideas and even specific expertise. I would imagine that there are, um, or there is a population of people with a lot of expertise relevant to energy that could perhaps be pivoted. So um, thank you for sharing. I think that was a great example. I saw in the chat, um, we have one person that said, you know, for their community, affordability coupled with proximity, excuse me, proximity to large markets. I think that's a great asset to identify. Oftentimes we're seeing our sort of second tier cities or um, metro adjacent communities doing quite well. That seems to have been the trend now for a while. So I think identifying that makes a lot of sense um, and true for a number of places throughout the state and country. So um, a lot of entrepreneurial ecosystem, at least from my viewpoint, the, the best of it is happening on the ground in communities. It's, I wouldn't say that there's, you know, a large and well-developed literature about what entrepreneurial ecosystem look, it looks like. I think this is coming from communities. Um, I would say that I do think the literature points to a couple of key components um, that we could focus on for just a few minutes. So one component um, within sort of the infrastructure bucket of the entrepreneurial ecosystem is broadband. The literature more and more points to how access to broadband supports startup activity, especially among the very smallest businesses, so sort of one man and one woman shops, rural businesses, including the most remote rural. So the more remote a place, the bigger the effect of having broadband in terms of startup activity and women-owned businesses. So perhaps because women-owned businesses are more likely to be home-based, for example, having broadband supports these types of ventures. So that's just one reason it might be the case that we see uh, broadband having larger payoffs for women-owned. So this is just another example of where I think thinking about the entrepreneurial ecosystem it can lead to some strategies that equitably enhance opportunities. So when we're thinking about small businesses, rural, women-owned, these are categories that do face particular challenges so we can even support them by building out our entrepreneurial ecosystem. Small business lending we know to be especially important in, even in rural areas. So we think that that's because in metro areas there might be more other choices of how to seek financing, um, for example, metro areas tend to have more venture capital or more um, activity in terms of venture capital. Homes are worth more in metro areas oftentimes, so people have um, home equity loans or more opportunity through home equity loans. Um, they're just more financial institutions, but banks specifically are really important in rural areas. So we know that when there's more small business lending, we see more startup activity. But we want to think about more than just banks. If, um, if access to financial capital is a challenge in your community, we want to think broadly about what we can do about that. So it, maybe the answer is not banks. Maybe the answer is to check in with credit unions. Um, credit unions have an upper bound on how much of their, uh, how much lending activity they can do to businesses, but maybe there are ways to increase that. Um, community development financial institutions also have a reputation for um, working well with historically underserved communities. Um, rotating loan funds have been a way to get um, some financing to local entrepreneurs. We've heard of local investment groups, so perhaps a group of wealthy individuals coming together and operating as a small investment group. Community supported enterprise can also be um, a vehicle for supporting entrepreneurs. Childcare is another important component of 
infrastructure. So more childcare we know leads to more self-employment. So not only is childcare important for raising labor force participation, but also for um, or encouraging entrepreneurship. So entrepreneurs kind of like any other worker need internet and they need childcare and, and that sort of thing. Uh, we also know that social capital is really important. So the networks, norms, and trusts that define our communities can be leveraged to support entrepreneurs. Um, and we have some, some resources from Extension both here and then highlighting some work from um, my colleague Sarah Lowe at the University of Missouri. We'll talk about these in a little bit more detail. So a lot of you may have seen this map and um, I apologize that I don't have a, a bigger map for or a countrywide map, map for those of you who aren't from Wisconsin. But we know that broadband is still a challenge in Wisconsin pockets of um, the state going without service. And what this map does, um, or what I would want for you to take away from it are two things. So in blue, that helps us understand where are the places that um, need infrastructure. So this is these are places where the FCC has said these services likely do, or these places likely don't have access to broadband. So in these communities in blue, likely infrastructure is a key challenge. So um, increasing supply, this is sort of a supply side argument. So if we were to pursue a broadband strategy um, to, to work towards developing our entrepreneurial ecosystem, you know, the supply side or thinking about infrastructure is gonna be key for a lot of communities. The very darkest gray or darkest purple, depending on what your screen looks like, um, these are places where the FCC has said, actually, we think there's access in these communities, but the um, American Community Survey is telling us that households um, aren't subscribing or for whatever reason, a significant portion of households are saying they do not have internet. So that's interesting. So if what is happening in these places where there is access, but we have households that aren't subscribing? There are a couple of possible answers to that question, but one of them is affordability. That yes, it's available, but it's not affordable to households. And so um, affordability or adoption is also a key component of building um, or of increasing access to broadband and as a means of building the entrepreneurial ecosystem if we want to think about it in that context. So um, digging just a little bit more I mentioned um, a lot of this already, so I won't spend a lot of time, but we know that broadband is the sort of research-based way to support entrepreneurship, and I have a couple of resources here um, to support um, where that comes from, but I wanted to highlight the opportunity. So yes, infrastructure. I think that there's a fair amount of resources and momentum behind increasing our uh, broadband infrastructure, but I also um, want to highlight adoption, as I mentioned before. So places where affordability, for example, might be a challenge. Um, so less than one quarter of federal spending on rural expansion has gone towards affordability and adoption. Um, there is some great research from, from Brian Whitaker and Roberto Gallardo, and they talk about how there is lower adoption rates of broadband in rural areas. And what they find is that more so than infrastructure, this is attributable to uh, demographic characteristics. So we have an older population or a less educated population, and that actually explains a lot of why we have low adoption in rural areas. So when it comes to increasing broadband, we want to also be thinking about what are strategies to enhance adoption. So we have affordability, so that could be assistance for households who could utilize programs with a subsidy work, um, thinking about keeping the cost of infrastructure down so that those cost savings could hopefully be passed on to consumers. There are a few reasons why that might not happen, but that could be part of the equation. Um, thinking about competition and alternative models, so a cooperative model of providing broadband, for example, could lead to lower prices, just because rather than a profit maximizing model cooperatives uh, aim to maximize service to their members. So it leads to slightly different objectives. And then thinking about preferences, how do we um, help people understand the value or relevance of broadband, which might increase their willingness to pay, 
and then also digital literacy. So making sure people have the skills and tools necessary to make the most of the service and, and get the benefit. So one way, these are just some ideas for thinking about focusing on broadband as one component of the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Another I wanna spend a little bit more time on is lending. So lending has been slow to recover from the Great Recession. So what I'm showing here is changes in small business loan volume and count on a per capita basis. So you see this sort of run up before the Great Recession peaking in 2007. A uh, pretty dramatic decline. And then this is for the, for the US, I should say, not just for Wisconsin. And then a relatively slow recovery when we compare this to other economic statistics, whether that's income growth or employment or something along those lines, I would say that this looks pretty tepid compared to how other aspects of the economy have come back. So if banks are less active in lending to small businesses, um, what other options are there? So here's another um, graph showing the number of branches. So these are particular locations of a bank and then the number of institutions. So um, BMO Harris is an institution. U.S. Bank is an institution. And what's interesting is that since 2007, both of these have declined. So that says to me two things. One is that bank services might be harder to find and that there are just fewer actual establishments to go to. And there is likely less competition between banks because there are fewer institutions. So even though you might have two banks, uh, maybe they're both U.S. bank locations or maybe they're both BMO Harris. And so you're not getting the competitive effects of having multiple providers. So two potential challenges that communities are facing or three rather, losing branches, losing institutions, and then this sort of slow um, recovery since the Great Recession. And so this is all focusing on banks. So I want to pivot in thinking about financing opportunities that if we're in an environment where banks are less active, what does community supportive enterprise look like? So this could be community ownership of a business. So we might see this with a grocery store or a bar, or there are a number of sort of different examples of community members coming together to take ownership of a business because they want to sustain it in their community. Community membership, so a monthly membership model can also help to sustain a business. And then as I mentioned, these other types of institutions can be really integral to filling this hole um, of financing for communities. Childcare, um, we know that childcare availability boosts labor force uh, participation as self-employment, as I mentioned. Um, Female labor force participation is generally five to 10 percentage points lower than for males in these sort of prime working years. So um, I think that's 25 to 54, if I remember correctly. Um, so it's already lower. And then we hit the pandemic. So female labor force particip participation reached its lowest point uh, in decades during the recession. So we know at least anecdotally and more and more research is coming out that childcare was part of that, especially for women. So a couple of figures to, to look at on the far right, we have the change in civilian labor force participation just in that one month when kids were going back to online school last August to September. So a, a huge decline for women. And then in the bottom graphic comes from um, some work with Kristen Rungi. Um, she ran a survey and the part that especially jumps out to me is the question on the right. So 42% of women saying I cut back on hours or quit a job because of the cost of childcare, whereas just 20% of men agreed with that same statement. So clearly for women in their careers, childcare is really important. That career might be as a wage and salary employee, but it could also be as an entrepreneur. And let's not forget that childcare providers are entrepreneurs themselves. It's a female dominated sector. So not necessarily all women, but mostly women in the sector. And having entrepreneurial supports in place is also about getting female childcare providers to think of themselves as entrepreneurs and recognize themselves as business owners and thinking about how we can support them. I have a couple of resources here. Um, I think pros and cons refer depending on what you would like to learn when you're looking for information. So 
On the left, we have from the Department of Children and Families in Wisconsin, their map of child care providers. So here you can look up child care providers by zip code on the or down the right hand side of that map is a list of child care providers and they have the number of slots, which I find really helpful. So sure, you might have child care providers, but if every slot is full, that might not be helpful to an entrepreneur or a working parent who's looking for an open spot. So having this count of slots, I found really useful. You notice though, there, there are a lot of zeros. So childcare availability kind of showing up here in a particular way that some of you might find helpful. On the right, we have a resource from American Progress where they have mapped childcare deserts. So Wisconsin blends in here with the surrounding area, but what we have are areas in orange where childcare is scarce down to blue where childcare is considered adequate. So most of Wisconsin, especially in rural Wisconsin, is in this category of scarce childcare. So different ways to look up in your region where you might be standing right now and um, kind of thinking about the direction you might want to head in terms of childcare. So I want to point out a couple of opportunities. There are resources from Extension. Um, Brandon, I might tap you at the end to update us on um, what that looks like in terms of the boot camps and things that have been offered. Uh, we have been learning about a shared services model. So this is something that WEDC, the Wisconsin Economic or Wisconsin Early Childhood Developed, WECD, I think I said it wrong. Um, shared services model that they've been involved in developing where we group together several providers, childcare providers, and then for this group, we can link them to business service providers. And so in sharing business services, there are some cost savings that can lend itself to a more sustainable childcare model. Childcare cooperatives, so looking at employee-owned, business-owned, or parent-owned cooperatives could be a way forward for some communities. And then of course, engaging the broader community. More and more, we're starting to talk to hospitals who are interested in working towards a childcare solution in their communities. Schools are participating in childcare solutions in terms of offering physical spaces and buildings and that sort of thing. So bringing people together, figuring out what assets are available between the group can be a way forward. Um, the last component that I wanna talk about here is the sort of social capital component. And one of the ways we think about social capital is how we are treating newcomers into the community. So that could look a number of different ways. I'm highlighting here foreign born entrepreneurs, um, some really interesting facts. So foreign born individuals are more than twice as likely to start a business than um, native born citizens. And international students founded one out of every four US startups valued at greater than $1 billion. So a lot of entrepreneurial talent seemingly in this population. The Midwest tends to have fewer foreign born residents in Wisconsin, we have pretty good representation or, or parity. So 5% of Wisconsin population is foreign born and they represent 5% of entrepreneurs. So again, kind of thinking about um, this high propensity population, which is um, to some extent, or if when we look at the US, we have 13.5% of the population and 16% of entrepreneurs. So foreign born individuals being overrepresented in this entrepreneurial category. Um, so we were thinking about, are we welcoming to people from other places, from other cultures? And it's really not just about being welcoming to um, the individual person, but in the context of entrepreneurship, are we welcoming to new ideas um, and, and doing things differently and, and that sort of thing? Uh, we don't have to think about this in an international context, context though. Uh, we might also think about this in terms of in-migration from other states. And what we see here is that Wisconsin is relatively low in terms of in-migration from other states. Uh, but how do we treat those people that do come here from other states? Are they welcome in, into our communities? They come from somewhere else. Um, they bring resources with them oftentimes, whether that's life experience, human capital, financial resources. These are the makings of or the inputs to entrepreneurship. So we want to be thinking about how we treat and welcome individuals. Perhaps this is part of increasing our in-migration as well. Um, another aspect of the sort of social capital or relational aspect of entrepreneurship is thinking 
to about being age inclusive with our entrepreneurship programming that oftentimes we might think of the typical entrepreneur as maybe uh, a 30 something uh, in tech, but that's really not the case. I'm um, certainly that individual exists. But what you see here in the United States is actually the large majority of entrepreneurs are in this 45 to 64 age group. So most entrepreneurs might actually be um, older than stereotypes would have us think. And we wanna be sure to be thinking inclusively about our entrepreneurship programming um, that all individuals are, are targeted in terms of developing that talent. Um, and here I have a blurb sort of specifically focusing on how in rural America, older entrepreneurs are moving to rural towns because they love the lifestyle. And that becomes a place where they maybe start their sort of second career as an entrepreneur. Uh, and so this could be a real asset, I think, in a lot of Wisconsin communities as well. So thinking about social capital and immigration, just to summarize, um, I think there are some good resources from Extension. I have colleagues that work on um, placemaking. So keeping in mind that entrepreneurs are footloose, they're not tied or anchored to an employer in the same way that a wage and salary worker might be. So if they can live wherever they want. Why might they want to live in your community? And I think our placemaking team can help communities think about that. Um, near and newly retired populations. These, this is a group of people with high human capital. Oftentimes they've had the opportunity to accumulate some financial capital. Those can be key ingredients into an entrepreneurial venture. So there's a lot of um, potential with some age inclusive programming and initiatives. And again, welcoming people who maybe have recently retired and moved into the community. And then this foreign born population, keeping in mind that this is a high potential um, population to be welcoming and inclusive of with our entrepreneurial efforts. And then I'm gonna go through here just a number of um, programs that exist out there, some from extension in other states. Um, so this is connecting entrepreneurial communities. Typically um, connecting entrepreneurial communities um, is run locally. You would go to a place and have this sort of entrepreneurship focused conference. Um, last year it was online. Um, I had a great virtual presentation, but this is about creating and connecting entrepreneurial active, um, uh, communities, sharing ideas and that sort of thing. So one type of event that could be uh, held to support entrepreneurial ecosystem building and, and help develop ideas. Um, the next one that are another opportunity coming up. So for example, one is being hosted in Missouri at the end of next month. Again, I just wanted to give examples of, of what communities are doing to focus on entrepreneurship. Um, I'm highlighting Homegrown here. This is a program that I developed with Mia Young and Diana Hammer, as well as Sarah Lowe at the University of Missouri. So this is a day long workshop, getting people your geared towards getting people thinking about that entrepreneurial ecosystem and, and where they land in that entrepreneurial ecosystem and how they can connect with others. And then a number of examples and reports from other communities. So if you're thinking about this, um, there are certainly other communities that have been thinking about it too and might have some great guidelines for you. Um, I'm gonna check the chat. I have a little bit more. Brandon has shared about childcare. And... Can I, can I say something? Yes, please, Brandon. Tessa, um, just, just a little comment. It, it's, I just got off the off of a Zoom with the state DNR about uh, environmental justice, and we were talking about perspe cultural perspectives of uh, everything being connected, and we're part of the whole process. So it's it's interesting to see this kind of concept and entrepreneurship, and the, that people outside of tribal communities are finally catching up to us. That's supposed to be a little humor there, but still, it's nice to see. Oh, I think you're right. I um, More and more, I'm just seeing the sort of systems approach and thinking inclusively. I think um, as an economist, we've been slow to adopt. We like to think of, we don't like to think of things as being sort of tangled together and interwoven because that makes things a mess, a mess mathematically. But in reality, things are connected and interwoven. And, and I think that we should be thinking like this. And I hope we continue to move in that direction. Um, let's see. Um, 
Uh, Ronnie shared that uh, Minnesota has their Connecting Entrepreneurial Communities Conference coming up in a few weeks as well. So another opportunity to uh, maybe learn what other communities are doing. So thank you for sharing that. Um, with the last few minutes I have here, I'll just buzz through an example from Missouri that I got to sort of observe from the outside, but it was just a, a real world example of sort of one community's approach to building their entrepreneurial ecosystem. So I was connected with Northwest Missouri through Homegrown. We ran a workshop in this community uh, last fall, I think it was. And so connected to that was this sort of entrepreneurial ecosystem building opportunity. So their goal was to create a regional system that supports innovative entrepreneurship. So they were focused on this particular type of entrepreneurship. Um, they were focused on coordination and culture, uh, lack of broadband infrastructure. Those were kind of top of the list. And then they engaged with extension in their efforts for research uh, and analysis. They ran community conversations and then developed their strategy recommendations. Um, they also had a number of consultants that participated with them in terms of identifying how to move forward. And I think that this community is a good example of collaboration and strength utilization. So bringing together all of these different organizations, they were able to tap in into what each one is good at. So Kansas City SourceLink and Missouri SourceLink, we now have SourceLink com excuse me, coming to Wisconsin in a few communities. So this is a um, effort to map and get the lay of the land in terms of entrepreneurial support resources. Um, so this is a website in one form where you can look up all the different services available and entities that are helping. Um, and so you have this great kind of knowledge base of, of what's out there. Um, we had regional planning commissions that were part of it, technical assistance providers participating, um, political capital, so having leaders involved, and then two universities. So lots of people contributing, again, getting lots of people involved, people from different components or buckets of that entrepreneurial ecosystem. Their first order of business they decided was to develop, to develop a pipeline of entrepreneurs. So their survey indicated internships were needed. They ran focus groups that identified initiatives to build their entrepreneurial pipeline. So this meant having a curriculum at all levels. So from youth entrepreneurship programming to incubators, targeted training at um, immigrant and immigrants and people of color, mentoring, succession planning. So people at all different stages thinking about entrepreneurship. Um, so that's the first component. Cultivating technology exchange and innovation. So this is sort of that cultural component. One quote from the survey was, we need people that are motivated to change the status quo. So um, one of the survey respondents, or survey respondents, excuse me, said that they were slightly more negative than positive on technical assistance offered by regional educational institutions. So this was an opportunity to shift and adjust um, to provide better technical assistance or at least better connect with entrepreneurs. Um, and then this element of being welcoming also showed up in their survey. So one of the conclusions with this was that the region might benefit from increased focus on promoting the importance of diversity in communities. So it's fostering that sort of welcoming component and hopefully building that social cap capital across different groups within communities. They decided to focus also on financial capital. And within that component of the entrepreneurial ecosystem, they were strategic about identifying which type of financial capital they most needed to address. So for them, they found that focusing on this microloan category, and I would say that this is true in a lot of communities, that loans under $100,000 are pretty scarce or harder to get. And so focusing on what they could do in this sort of small loan category was really important. And then making sure that individuals were um, aware of resources so that if there was an entity or money out there available that people knew where to go and how to access it. Um, talent and networks. So they found that their downtown network was the best known network. So they focused on building that asset up 
And then um, also emphasize the need to invest in new networks and develop regional networks to connect entrepreneurs to the various support organization and other mentors, for example. So building up that networking component in their communities. And then last, their, um, their final strategy was to focus on broadband access. So lots of people, again, um, we have examples of who played a part in focusing on broadband, bringing lots of entities together to try to work on access. So I just wanted to give a kind of quick example of what one community did. We have a few minutes left to chat. If anybody would like to um, ask questions or share comments, I'm happy to hang out for a bit. So Tessa, where would you start? Oh, it depends. My apologies, but I always want to put you on the spot. Yeah. The brains. Yeah. <laughs> well, the and, and here I am giving you the um, less impressive economist answer of it depends. And I, I, in all sincerity, I do think it depends on the community. I think some communities right now have a lot of momentum behind solving um, their broadband availability challenges. And so if that's where there is momentum and that's where there are some assets, I think that makes sense as a great first step. It's, I may be biased because that's something I've been thinking a lot about for the last two years. Um, but, you know, that could be a good starting place. I think that childcare is also a great place to start. And part of the reason I say that is because childcare, like broadband, I think has widespread benefits. Yes, it supports entrepreneurs, but it also supports the labor force more generally. So, what I like about that and similar, so broad, broadband, childcare, we don't have to overthink entrepreneurial support. It doesn't have to be a fancy incubator. It doesn't have to be a tech investment fund. Entrepreneurs need a lot of the same things everybody else needs. And so we can support entrepreneurs with you know, some good economic development policy that has broad and wide sweeping benefits. So I would start with those types of strategies. You know, Tessa, I was uh, in a conversation yesterday with one of the, well, actually a Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reporter and asking about why the certain counties in Wisconsin gain, certain rural counties in Wisconsin and in the North gained population, there was a few. And if you notice, Bayfield, Vilas, and Sawyer are among those that stand out. So we're talking Hayward and Sawyer, Eagle River, and uh, Bayfield County. But Bayfield and Vilas have been promoting remote work or come up here and work from home. And I know that Vilas has a very good, fostered a very good entrepreneurial culture and environment. Because while you were speaking, I just got a, uh, a, a message on women on promoting women entrepreneurs in Vilas County from the uh, economic development uh, 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 director here. And uh, as far as uh, Hayward goes, uh, I don't know as much about their uh, uh, culture of entrepreneurship. I know that they have the, they've built a life uh, year round culture now around that Berkebiner event that they have and everything. So that might be more social capital. I can't explain, but Bayfield and Vilas were the two that I wanted to focus on because they have been promoting that remote work uh, ethic. And again, Vilas gained seven and a half percent population in Bayfield, somewhere around. Uh, that amount as well, and the rest of them didn't uh, didn't fare nearly as well. Yeah, I think um, even before the pandemic, but definitely with the pandemic, you know, we're better understanding the possibilities of remote work, and I'm really hopeful of what that means for rural communities, both in terms of remote wage and salary work, but also remote entrepreneurial work. That so many entrepreneurial ventures seem to be in part, if not entirely online. Um, I've been learning and thinking a little bit about this through the surge of um, new business applications that have, so the business formation statistics, if that's familiar to any of you, shows this huge surge in entrepreneurial activity during the pandemic like we haven't seen before. And part of the explanation they think is that, you know, this rise of online businesses. So if that's the case, then perhaps they can live anywhere and that will be good news for rural communities, at least the ones that have broadband.
Uh, so it looks like there's one more question from Nancy and we're just at one o'clock. So I don't know if you want to try to take that. Sure. Um, I, I wish we knew Nancy. Um, Nancy asked, you know, what can we do to help communities become more welcoming? I think that um, my colleagues in on the placemaking team might have some good suggestions in terms of what is welcoming. Um, Kristen Rungi has talked about, you know, community marketing and, and a newcomers club. And then there's also some work, um, I don't know if Steve is still on the call, but the Iowa Community Survey, they're looking at the importance of social capital and the places that have a great attitude, Steve, are you there? Um, that makes a big difference in how an influx of a new community impacts the, the town at large and that sort of thing. Uh, Steve, do you wanna talk a little bit about that? Yeah, um, just quickly. Um, some of you may be familiar with the, the Ron Schaefer, the Schaefer Star, um, where he kind of tries to lay out a systems thinking approach for community economic development. And it started off as a diamond. And uh, one of the nodes was rules. And when Dave Marcullier and I were working with Ron on, on rewriting his textbook, we had lengthy discussions about what we meant by rules. And we convinced Ron that it needed to be broken up into two parts. One is kind of formal rules. That's that's laws, that's regulations. Um, that's the court systems, things like that. The other is informal rules. And, you know, is culture the right word? Um, it's attitudes. It's is the glass half full, is the glass half empty? And Ron was really hesitant to break that out. And the reason he was really hesitant is because as economists, we don't know how to respond to that. As, as economists saying, you know, the community, the glass is always half empty. We as economists don't feel comfortable talking about that because we don't know any strategies. But it's, it's, it's the elephant in the room. So I think that this is where, um, you know, the sociologists have something to say. There's even a group of community psychologists that study this type of stuff. And some of the best work that I've seen that I can relate to is the, the, the small town Iowa project that, that Tessa just referred to. Um, and we had, if you were on the uh, Rural Economic Summit back in January, we had someone from Iowa talk about that project and we wanted to do some follow-up with it here, but it's um, um, funding opportunities is, is limiting it. But it's, it's, it's the elephant in the room. And um, I, th I think Tessa, if I'm not, when you kind of move from kind of thinking about entrepreneurship from, you know, kind of business development to kind of entrepreneurial ecosystems, I think part of what drove you was a couple of county educators said, we get it. We understand that the, the you know, the a dynamic economy requires small business startups, but our community is just not entrepreneurial. What do we do? And it's that whole kind of culture thing. And there's no, there's no easy answer to it. And I'm starting to ramble a little bit here. Thanks, Steve. Um, we're a little over time. So I don't know, Brandon, if you want to stop recording, I can still hang out for a minute if people